Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is your main host, Rudo Barishich, back again with two of my special guests. Uh, I have Jeffrey Nyquist joining me again, and the most shadow band man in the land, Lamar Esmo. Welcome, gentlemen, to the next segment of the discussion where we left off last time. How are you doing, gentlemen? Very good. I'm doing great. It was a super interesting topic, and we discussed about alt-right, Duganism. We ended up with Zionism, and we ended up about um, the state of Israel. And like, and, and the, the discussion was raised in a way that I said, for instance, that it's very important to bear in mind, uh, without overemphasizing one dimension over another, I said that we have to look into how certain oligarch families have been able, through certain lobbying efforts and through financial power, able to, let's say, influence the interests of certain great powers to support a tiny state that is able to expand its frontiers in a way that we have not seen in comparison to other m- m- tiny states operating within the Western liberal, let's say, democratic system. So. And and Jeff said, you know, we need to look at the, the biggest problem that we are facing is obviously international socialism and also that the United States and the West is under and uh, maybe under a potential nuclear attack from the Chinese, from the Russians. So the Zionist issue is not as that important as the imminent threat from the Chinese and the Russians. And if we look at what Lamar said, Lamar said that we need to definitely look into how the Zionists could, can manipulate certain actors and states to to conduct their policy in a certain way. And I believe that this this is both of these gentlemen are correct. Correct. And I I, I usually say that we have to monitor what's happening with the Chinese Russian alliance and how they seek to create an alternative globalization. However. I argue that this is uh, also influenced by Zionism too. So I believe that we definitely need to pay attention to um, to the Zionist issue too. Now, um, Jeff, b- b- before we start, um, I-, I want you to continue, in, like you said, that you said when we ended the last discussion that the problem is international socialism and that it's 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 not appropriate to to say that one ethnic group within this you know power structure has been able to utilize power to that extent rather you view it as ethnically neutral so you view it we're dealing with you have socialists in power they're running the show and they're can you please just briefly summarize before lamar jumps in and give, give us your uh, view about this. Go ahead. Yeah, well, I I think obviously there's a a deep philosophical spiritual crisis that has overcome Western civilization. Uh, Mm -hmm. Western civilization started, you know, you get to 1900, the the turning of the 20th century, and you find Western civilization, uh, the European countries in the United States are the dominant civilization on the planet. They've got colonies everywhere. Um, And uh, they're really calling the shots everywhere. And uh, you have, uh, though deep within it, you have the uh, outbreak of new ideas like Darwinism, like Marxism, uh, like Hegel, like uh, the modern philosophers. And there there is an inability to uh, conceive of the world uh, supernaturally uh, by the uh, by, the elite more and more moving towards positivism, materialism, uh, and and an explanation of a universe without uh, divine order, without providence, uh, and and sort of the 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 um, the lower instincts of man given free reign. You have World War One, this incredible civil uh-huh. war within Western civilization, out of which comes at the end the Bolshevik Revolution. The destruction of of the Russian Empire, the the the, the slaughtering of the Tsar and his family, and and you have this 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 revolution in the complexity of Russia, as an formerly Orthodox Christian power becoming then suddenly an atheist communist state, the Soviet Union, the first one of its kind, um, that completely begins uh, to to manifest itself in this in this world. 
you know, you had the ideas of Marx and Engels, and then you had Lenin, and then it just started from them throughout the 20th century. This thing started spreading everywhere. And it is spread to the fact that even in the United States today, these ideas are extremely powerful. They're throughout our universities and our media. And we're having a kind of insurrection now based on these ideas that have uh, they have uh, put on certain ideological clothes. You know, Marx's conflict theory now uh, has gone to sex. It's gone to race, you know, in addition uh-huh. to economic class. So you have this um, hmm. this continuation of the revolution, and it promises to to basically destroy civilization itself across the planet, and that hmm. is what I see as the real crisis. Very good. Okay, Lamar, please. I know Jeff mentioned a lot of uh, aspects right now, but just give me give me your take briefly too. The way you see it, we end it with this like. You and I discussed that when you unmask the powers that be, you suddenly realize, wait a minute, it's not just, you know, an ethnically neutral, you know, a group running the show. You obviously can tell that you have an overrepresentation of a certain ethnicity within certain sectors. Now, uh, please, oh, any thoughts on this? Go ahead. Uh, definitely. Um, a good case in point. I'm glad um, uh, Jeff brought up the um, the uh, Soviet Union um, being created after World War One because another outcome of World War One was the breakup of the uh, Ottoman Empire, which um, kept that promise to uh, Lord Rothschild. But in addition to that, you had 88% of the Bolsheviks being, according to Vladimir Putin, 88% of them were um, of that particular ethnicity. And um, that particular ethnicity during the uh, revolution did not have any of its uh, religious structures harmed. And it it was actually um, made a crime to be uh, anti-Hebrew. You could get the death penalty in in Bolshevik Russia. And um, many of the um, what conservatives here in the United States would refer to as a radical left. Um, When you peel back that curtain, as you said, they would be... um, spearheaded by that particular ethnicity. So, um, you know, it's so for, so for me, I understand it. It's like an onion. There are different layers or, or a pyramid. We talked about this earlier. You do have other interests. You do have a uh, corporate and financial interests, um, certain institutions and people want to acquire resources from a given area. A good example of that would be um, the United, I think it was called United Brands, but um, predecessor to uh, Chiquita Bananas actually got the United States to orchestrate a coup in uh, Honduras, I believe it was. So there are other elements to it, but in, in, in many cases you see um, in, in, you know, a, a Hebrew presence. Um, and um, especially when it comes to Marxist socialism, uh, one of the things I probably need to stop doing on my channel is referring to myself as a socialist because people forget that there are other socialist thinkers and um, socialists that predate Marx and uh, other theories for socialism. And it's been run through the mud. Um, just like under uh, President Trump, the word populism has become a dirty word. Uh, when in fact the original populist party in the United States uh, under um, um I can't recall the gentleman's name, uh, Bryant, I believe, uh, William William Jennings Bryant. Um, populism was actually good. He had his party had a platform that would have helped uh, not only uh, whites in the United States during the late 1800s, but it also would have helped black people as well. So populism is actually uh, an, another word that's being uh, sullied uh, by contemporary politics. But um, socialism has been run through the mud, and I do. There are other socialists as well, um, and, and this is part of the reason why Cuba, he brought up Cuba as well. Why is the United States on friendly terms with Vietnam, uh, China, and, and, and other, um, you know, communist, supposed communist dictatorships where um, you have Cuba is, is not in that embrace, it's not in that financial uh, embrace, and it's, it's because the Cubans actually uh, don't have a Rothschild-controlled bank, so... Again, when you do have socialism that is actually grassroots and popular uh, and it doesn't work in favor of the tribe, that's the outcome. 
Uh, Jeff, would you reply before I jump in too? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, uh, I don't think, I mean, I don't, that's an interesting, I never heard that idea about to Cuba, but uh, look, um, uh, the Bolshevik revolution, uh, the leader of the revolution was Lenin, and Stalin succeeded him, and Khrushchev succeeded him. The head of the Cheka was Felix Straczynski, succeeded by Menzhinsky. They were Polish aristocrats. Uh, none of these figures are Jewish. Now, the Jews are overrepresented in certain bodies of the Soviet Union. They're overrepresented in a revolutionary movement. They became overrepresented in the Soviet bureaucracy after the, the, the Soviet bureaucracy went on strike, and Lenin just simply replaced them because he didn't want to deal with the strike. That's partly how that happened. You had a reservoir of educated Jewish people. This history is very complicated. Uh, I think Solzhenitsyn goes into it pretty well in, in 200 years together. And, and, and there is the persecution of the Jews that made them a pariah people over 2,000 years. And uh, of course, you're going to have a natural playback on that. And you're going to have certain consequences from that. And that creates a complicated history. But I think that it's a mistake to attribute the, the socialist movement, uh, the international socialist, the Marxist-Leninist movement, to an ethnic group, that it's somehow their plan. This is, um, I, and, and this is a to... question of, of fact and, and you know, uh, okay. history. Uh, obviously, people are going to disagree, but uh, look, if you look at this closely, you cannot really explain the facts of history with the with the the theory that it's that it's uh, that that this is just simply a, a Jewish movement because it's not. You look at China. China is a is the largest communist Marxist Leninist state right now, and well, Chinese they're not Jewish. You know that's a different race altogether. They're not even Europeans. They have their history is in a different, completely different part of the world. Um, so it's. I think that in it, we we ought to concentrate on the deeper philosophical meanings and ideas. The the real argument here is the argument between materialism versus a supernaturalist view of of uh, the cosmos. It it has to do with the nature of power and limited government, whether we're going to have that, whether there are, uh, whether property rights should be respected, which economic system is best for human beings. And, mm -hmm. and where freedom fits into this. I think those are the key issues. I mean, uh, wouldn't you both yeah. agree to that? I, I just wanted a, uh, a yes, quick I rem uh, that's very, uh, j just a quick remark, you know, about the Soviet Union. Obviously, how many were the Jewish people? I think it was 2% of the Soviet population at that time. Now, we have discussed this in the past. I believe that it was a, a huge overrepresentation within the nomenclatura, within the Soviet state apparatus. We, we don't have to go into it, but there was obviously... And an within the NKV. Yes, yes. Uh, and, yeah. and you had, for instance, people like Ilya Ehrenberg, Leonid Reichmann, uh, and so on, and, and many more. But we, we, we don't have to go into it. But I want to ask you, Jeff, now, if you look at the socialist movement in the United States, for instance, one of the founders of the U.S. Communist Party, Benjamin Ben Gitlow, who we have touched on before, also a man of Jewish descent. If you look at the one, who are the ones, if the principal actors involved between, let's say, the change of um, the, the migration law in the United States from 1965, there are data, say, I mean, convincing data showing that you had also the Jewish communities pushing for a change of, of, of the immigration law in the United States. And you had also, if you look at just the Frankfurt School, these post-Marxists, an overrepresentation also people of Jewish descent. Now, I'm not saying that it's solely a Jewish phenomenon or that the Jews are totally running the show, but obviously you have an overrepresentation in those sectors too, um, in the United States and also in the Soviet. So, what would you say about that? Well, I would say the Communist Party USA has not ever been really run by the Jews, and Benjamin Gitlow did not receive the position of head of the. He was going to be the head of the Communist Party USA. Stalin was intending to make him that, but he fell out with Stalin and he got kicked out. I mean, and his friend John Reed 
who was the, the chosen favorite of the American communists of the, of the Bolsheviks in Moscow. He was not Jewish at all. He was here from Oregon. He was, he was a non-Jewish person. You've got, uh, look, the heads of the Communist Party USA, they have not, for the most part, been Jewish people. I, I, Gus Hall wasn't Jewish. I think he was of Finnish nationality, I think, uh, as I recall. Uh, look, the, 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 uh, there was the, the one, uh, William Browder's dad was the one uh, Jewish guy that was ahead of it during World War II, but before and after him, they weren't Jewish uh, people that were heading the party. So uh, I, I, I think they're, they're present there. Like Jews are, there's Jews on the capitalist side. There's Jews that are liberals and anti-communists. Mm. You know, I, I know some of them, the, uh, some but of the in Jewish general, people are anti-communists. In sure, general, what? Are, in general, if you look at, let's say, the American Jewry, is always more leaning towards, let's say, progressivism and left-leaning, historically speaking. Now, of course, you have uh, billionaires like we have touched, but if you if you show the the, the nation polls in the United States, they've been very leaning towards progressivism and leftist. Well, well let's in let's let's get down to that. Um, traditionally, before a lot of Jews came from the the Jews that happened to have the socialist slant tend to come from Poland and Russia, from the former Russian Empire, because Poland was part of the former Russian Empire. Those Jews mm. tended to go to the left, tended to go to socialism. Uh, when you're talking about the traditional, um, the, the kind of Jews that settled in the United States, before this big influx of East European Jews, Jews in America were conservative. They tended to favor the economic system. They tended to be liberals, not socialists. And so this, this shift, which occurred within the Jewish community, occurred, be, occurred because of this overwhelming immigration of East European Jews. It really came, came from that subgroup. Uh, and I think you'd find, if you go into Jewish history, that there is this division uh, within the Jews, uh, and, and that that's where it started to change. I'm going to leave it up to the audience. Is it a huge coincidence? that you have prominent people of Hebrew descent, you know, being involved in the change of immigration act from 1965 in the United States and overrepresentation within the Frankfurt School, within critical theory. I'm going to leave it up to the audience. And then also that you had an overrepresentation in the Soviet Union. Uh, but, we, but I want, I want to, please go ahead, Lamar, go ahead and fill in so I don't talk too much. It's, I want to hear, I want to get your take on this. Uh, um, <clears throat> one of the um, uh, things that Jeff just mentioned was the fact that, yes, you do have um, Jewish individuals who are on the um, political. We have um, a few um, who are really popular here uh, on talk radio and in Republican circles. You have like your Mark Levine's and um, Ben Shapiro's. But it, 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 and, and this is going to. It sounds like I'm giving too much uh, power to this particular group, but um, it's just, you can't understate it. Capitalism also works in their favor as well, uh, so it's a win-win for them. Um, which is why one of the, my, one of my favorite political philosophers, Mikhail Bakunin, who was um, a minor, um, he was a, a white Russian, uh, a really uh, minor figure, um, royal family. Um, his father was some sort of um, baron in, in one of the areas, um, I think near, was it Murmansk? But anyway, long story short, uh, what Bakunin noticed, because he, he met Karl Marx, is that um, Marx didn't, did, didn't criticize any of the real capitalists of that era, your Rothschilds, your Lazar, um, you know, Kuhn, Loeb and Company. And he, instead he focused strictly on the, uh, the Gentiles, the, and, and, and my thing with, with capitalism is, um, yes, it, it, it does have its, its good points. You, you know, because you, you have economies based on productivity, but, you know, who, who reaps the benefits of it? You know, it's, it, so they win either way is what, is what I'm trying to say. Bakunin noticed this. He said, you know, he said that uh, Marxism and capitalism take you to the same destination. They just uh, take different paths to that destination. You still end up the monopoly of power and um, of financial and political power by by a small minority. And um, I, did, I mean, look at look at what's happening today. You have a lot of people in the uh, right wing of the media here in the United States that are trying to you know scaremonger with socialism. But the 
United States is nowhere near socialist or Marxist. Um, Nancy Pelosi, who's a liberal, actually said that she's a capitalist, which she is. She's not in favor of um, a, a Politburo, of universal health care, universal housing, universal. So there's no, we're, we're going to the same place as a uh, Marxist socialism would take us. But we're taking the capitalist uh, approach to that uh, destination. Is, um, but I think everyone should, should check out Mikhail Bakunin because um, he was one of those um, socialists who had a different perspective on uh, on socialism and capitalism. Oh, well, that's good. That's very good. Please, Jeff, what would you say about this? Go ahead. Well, I I, I think that uh, Karl Marx was anti-Semitic. He uh, he attacked Jewish capitalism. He blamed the Jews. Uh, in 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 context of capitalism, um, and and the thing is, I think it goes back to real religious convictions, and the religious convictions of socialism, of Marxism, Leninism, and and ver, ver, you know that kind of socialism. It, it's a definitely it's a worldview, and it's not a Jewish worldview. It's a very different. Well, you have an anomaly in that thinking because Moses Hess, who was a, a Jewish philosopher had tremendous effect on Karl Marx's way of thinking, too. So I think it's an uh, ambivalence in Marx's thinking uh, as well, because on the one hand, yes, he did outline some criticism against Jews, but on the other hand, he was very much influenced by Moses Hess, too, who was an, you know, a proud Jew as well, and has influenced, I believe, also the Zionist socialist uh, movement uh, in, in Israel. Well, you know, Karl, Karl Marx was very much attacking religion as the opening. And he was of the a people. Jew himself as well. And, but yeah. Well, he was, uh, Karl Marx wasn't Jewish. Well, uh, he was raised as a Christian. So, uh, you know. Yeah, but ethnically through bloodline, yes. Well, I mean, you know, but that didn't, you know. We're talking about, you know, socialism is a religious idea. He was not following any kind of Jewish religious idea. He was, uh, you know, um, he was no more Jewish than uh, than I am or any of you guys are. No, that's uh, not true it, because it, it, you don't. Judaism is not only a religious component; it's also based on bloodline. You, Jeff, for instance, if you do not, yeah, if you yeah, are not but, able but to, to, to prove Marx, that you're Jewish, he, but you're not able to immigrate to Israel. Yeah, but but Mar Marxists do not give a hoot about bloodline. They don't care about what race somebody is. Their, so their it's all a coincidence. Is, huh? It's all a coincidence, the over the over representation, the activities it's of a, these it's people. It's a function in <laughs> Russia, it's a well first of all, they're all they're overrepresented in Russia. It's a function of Russian history, of who the people look, you're creating an atheist regime in a country where most people are Christians. Where are you going to get a reservoir of people you can trust to run the regime? You, mm. you know what I'm saying? So you're going to use that reservoir. You go to China, you don't have any Jewish representation in the Chinese Communist Party. Why? Uh, because there was that's part of the history of China. And the same thing when you go to Cuba. You're not going to get this big overrepresentation of Jews. Uh, I, I was going to I was going to say that um, it, a key within the way that they function is that um, as uh, Rudolph mentioned, they, they trace their lineage uh, mat matrilinear, matrilineally, I believe is mm -hmm. referred to. Them. So yeah. if your mother was Jewish, uh, to them, you're technically Jewish. And um, they don't, even in Israel, you have to be, believe in the religion, Judaism, as long as you uh, represent that bloodline. And um, uh, many, actually the Russians, um, there, was, there was a big falling out a few months ago. Um, one of the... Um, Rabbis actually accused a lot of the Russian uh, Jews in Israel of um he called them gore. He called it caused a, a massive up and um so they they don't really care about um and even within their own religion uh you you will find that um for for me my observation of them is is that the the religion is just a tool for them I don't think um many of them are really sincere about um you know. And, and, and afterlife, a god. It's more of a, a like a, a social club and um, a, a means to, to dominate others, I think. Just like the, the Sunni Muslims are similar, except for they're more overt. There's not a lot of spiritual um, 
you know, makeup to Sunni Islam. It's more so here are these prescribed practices you have to follow and, you know, go ahead and, um, you know, dominate others. And they have the same mentality except for they go about it in different ways. Um, that's that's my observation of, of both of those groups. Uh, <laughs> it's it's uh, the, the religion is a vehicle for them, put it that way. There's, there's no... Um, it, from from my observation, I mean, I know there are orthodox and ultra orthodox who who do actually believe in the spiritual aspect. But if you look at Israel, I mean, they have gay pride parades in Tel Aviv. That's totally antithetical to the the laws in Leviticus. Like if you read the, it's like over three hundred or so laws, and uh, one of the bigger ones is you know you're not supposed to uh, practice that sort of thing. But yet in Tel Aviv, you have one of the largest. Uh, gay pride festivals every year so but not uh, only that you have different criteria for testing you can do you can be a satanist you know and if you have jewish dna and they do <laughs> testing you can receive you know uh, israeli citizenship so they don't look at it and if you look at if you take the temperature of the israeli population you will find that the majority of them are in fact they are not, you know, they don't, they are not religious practicing Do You have the Shah's party, you know, con con containing of these, you know, ultra orthodox and so on. But the, the majority, they are not even believers in God and so on. It's just a cultural practice in order to exert some sort of ethnocentrism. Uh, I think um, they, they tend to, um, I forgot what, um, was it the uh, Sufis or... It could have been the Ismaili Muslims who um, one of their practices is to put on the cloak wherever they are. They put on the religious cloak of the. So what they do, I think, with all these ideologies and, and economic systems is that they they'll infiltrate or they'll, they'll, they'll represent so that if if the temperature changes to any given ideology or um, you know economic means they'll they'll switch you know they'll they'll have their people Emma Goldman for me is a good example of that because she pretended to be an anarchist um, socialist which you know I, I find it laughable she tried to um, say that she was influenced by Bakunin but um, if you were to observe her career it's like uh, they, they do this with with everything <laughs> it's yeah. it's really ingenious it's sinister yeah, they Go ahead, Jeff. Please go ahead. So, so, so you guys think they're the big threat? They're the boogeyman. Uh, you know, I kind of had this on the this question. Will I mean, I'm just listening to you, and I'm thinking, to oh, they think they're the boogeyman. I get yeah, it. Yeah, speaking for myself, Jeff. Yes, I do view them as a, a um, as as a, as like a boogeyman type of thing because I mean, they've been around. The ancient Egyptians called them the Habiru, which meant thief in their language. They've been doing this for thousands of years, infiltrating societies and destroying them from within. Like they, they'll infiltrate, they'll start from the bottom, and then they'll next thing you know, they'll be reaping all the rewards and, and pitting the the actual original groups that were there against each other. They're they're really, really good at doing this. They've been doing it for again thousands of years. And I want to and you also don't, and you don't see that modern socialism that, that uh, the Marxism-Leninism in Beijing and the regime in, uh, in the Kremlin, you don't oh, see yes, North I, Korea I, and Cuba and Venezuela. Yeah. You don't see a socialist bloc there that wants to basically crush the United States and put us under their heel. You don't see uh, that. In the, case, in the case of Venezuela, I would say no. I think Venezuela just wanted their sovereignty. Like It's a similar situation um, with, with, with Syria. I don't think they have no delusion or illusion that they could dominate the United States. I think what Chavez and Maduro want is Venezuela to be independent and to um, for them to decide what sort of economic system they want their country to, to follow. I don't think they want to project their system onto even their neighbors. Like Because if that were the case, so many Colombians took advantage of Venezuela in the early 2000s, um, seeking when when you know drug wars, etc. They had many Colombian refugees going to Venezuela, putting a strain on their healthcare system, putting a strain on their uh, education system because of Hugo Chavez's um, policy of national healthcare. 
So if Venezuela wanted to, they could have taken those expats from Colombia and turned them into some sort of agents that could have helped the FARC or any other socialist movement in Colombia undermine Colombia. But I didn't see them doing that. And um, now China, yes, China wants to supplant the United States as the number one power in the world. That's that's for sure. They're trying to do economically with their state capitalism and um, and Russia, ditto for Russia. Russia wants to be the number one power, or at the very least, they, they probably want to control what they call their near abroad. But um, mm-hmm. those other places, Cuba, there's no conceivable way that Cuba or North Korea could ever dominate the United States. That's just not possible. Yeah, but they're part of a socialist bloc. Look, I, I, uh, I talked to Chavez's pilot and head chief of air staff after he defected. Mm-hmm. And I wrote an article about it, and that's, you know, gosh, 19, 18 years ago now, uh, 18 years ago. And wow. what he told me was, he says, Chavez hates the United States. He wants to wage war on it economically, politically. He wants to eventually create a South American Soviet bloc to attack the United States physically. <clears throat> he wants to destroy it. He said when 9-11 happened and he saw those towers going down, he was so excited he sent this guy, he said, you fly over to Pakistan, and he gave him 10 million, and he said, you give this to the Taliban with a million are earmarked for bin Laden. I mean, you, wow. you tell me, and the thing is, it isn't a matter of Cuba being able to take down the United States by itself. It's part of a giant alliance of communist, Marxist, uh, Leninist, controlled and aligned case. countries. It's part of a movement that's going to, they want to obliterate us, Lamar. They want to destroy our country. Uh, you know, that could be possible, but um, we have more allies that don't, I, 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 they probably want to do that, but we have, um, if Cuba's allied with North Korea, we have the United Kingdom, France, Germany, um, much more significant allies, I think. Um, they could want to do that all they want, but is it really possible? I don't think it is. Yeah, I think that's, um, I mean, I don't think that we would be doing very well if we have to rely on the British, the French, and the Germans to come and help us. I think we'd be in pretty bad trouble. We have the Australians as well. I mean, the entire Anglophone world, and this is one of the things I talk about on my channel, my worldview is that um, the Anglophone is controlled and dominated by the the same people we were talking about earlier, and and that's the real power broker of, of most of the world. I mean... If you run afoul or you try to implement policies in your country that undermine, you know, the, the traders on Wall Street, you you will. I mean, again, look what we did to Honduras, uh, Nicaragua, and Guatemala. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we sick death squads on people for wanting to have a better way of life for, because they were exploited by fruit companies. I mean, it's the, the Anglophone is, is what is for me is the real demon of the world. We. We do so much damage okay. in terms uh, of the foreign policy. So, so you you don't think that that China's that bad then? From what I can tell, no, because China hasn't invaded uh, Vietnam or even Taiwan for that matter. They have their one China policy, but I don't see uh, the, the the Chinese bombing in Taiwan. You don't you don't dropping see off, them crushing uh, Tibet and killing Tibetans and putting tens of millions of people into a Lao guy that they never come back from. You don't see the forced organ donations where they say, well, we'll get you a young, healthy kidney here. Grab this kidney's the right blood type. Uh, I mean, those are I mean, evil, don't you think that that the, regime the, the, is pretty horrific? Don't you think that's pretty awful? I mean, you're going you're gonna to say that we are worse than the Chinese communist regime in terms of what we do? Uh, you know, if you, if you, I, I would have to say it's either even or we are actually worse because I mean, look, at, look at our record. I mean, the Chinese going into Tibet, uh, when the United States did westward expansion, I mean, some of the atrocities committed in places like Colorado and, um, you know, so you, you have a country that, that it was like their version of manifest destiny. My view of Tibet like China's manifest destiny. They didn't want uh, uh, India. Imagine how much more onerous India will be. That's another thing we we need to start talking about in the West. The Indian government and, and the, the, the whole Hindu thing isn't great either. 
I mean, all of these places have serious problems. The Chinese are definitely bad. What those internment camps for towards the Uyghurs, but um, I mean, we've been in more places and have done more things to more ethnic groups than I think China has. Um, you know, we we've, really? we've done we, a lot we've of killed damage. the we. You know, in the Guinness Book of World Records for mass murder. The number one mass murderer listed is Mao Zedong, and they credit him with killing 60 million people, right? Then they come Stalin. He's credited with killing 30 million, and then there's Stalin with Hitler with, I don't know, 11 or 15 million. I forget what they credit Hitler with. But, but that is the, that regime in Beijing is credited with the biggest mass murder. Now, if you were to try to categorize America as a mass murdering regime, you can't get anywhere near those numbers. Um, I would have to beg to differ if you if you go back far enough. So, for example, right after the 13 colonies, I mean, how many ethnic groups were totally annihilated? There are lands you'll never know. Um, you know, it's it, it, the United States has eliminated a lot of people. Um, if you go back for, and, and ditto for the if you do take the Anglophone uh, as an example, I mean. I'll bet you the Anglophone's body count is, is much higher uh, than, than either Mao or, um, you know, I, I'd... I'm, I'm, I'm shocked because, you know, when the United States formed, there were less than a million uh, Indians north of the Rio Grande. So you can't, even Do if you we killed really everyone, know that? and we did not, that is not what happened. Even if you killed everyone, you don't get anything like a fraction of it. From, and from the, what the, the, you look at the, the 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 things the bad things the U.S. has done, it's it doesn't even come close to the kind of scale of the brutality of those uh, regimes. And and although the United States has done uh, bad things, it has a belief in in certain things uh, that always brings us back to wait a minute that was wrong. No, we shouldn't have done that. Let's yeah. try to fix that. And not do that again. The Chinese regime, no, they're just dead ahead to just whatever they want. They're going to kill and destroy yeah. whatever they have to get there. I just, I just want to fill in a little bit here. I, I do understand both of you guys. If you look at the, the the massacres that have been done, let's say in the name of socialism and so on, we, you just look at the Soviet Union. You have the Holodomor from 1932 to 1933. On that short amount of time, how many people died there? It surpassed. Six million people, and then you have the if the civil war when the Bolsheviks came to power, how many millions died there? And then during the reign of Stalin, and then the great leap forward with with Mao Zedong, and then also if you look at the Khmer Rouge, uh, so, so so the list goes on and on. So obviously you have it, uh, and, and, and in that sense, the butchery that went on against their own people as well. Whereas on the other hand, I do understand too, if you look at Western, uh, let's say imperialism and colonialism, how many ha have been killed and so on. So, so I do get both takes from here. I just wanted to fill in with this. Um, uh, yeah, as a gentleman, we, we kind of- Yeah, we're uh, going off the tracks. <laughs> we're going off the tracks here a little bit, but, but it, it, in the market- But I mean, uh, but I mean Lamar, Lamar, you're an American, you're here in America, those missiles, over there in China and Russia are aimed at you. I mean, if if this country goes the, the, down, you and your family, the, the, which is are which is why, yeah, the, the, which is which is why I don't um, support those uh, governments at all, and um, especially in the case of, of Putin, because um, you know I believe he's just as um, Zionist as um, uh, you know not Trump. Donald Trump is the most Zionist president ever, but. A lot of our other presidents, you can liken uh, Putin to them. So, but yeah, I, I don't agree with um, with with their methods or or them being the actual hegemon. Uh, I, my my wish is that um, the world will become more regional. I, I don't think it, it, it's best for the world that that no particular country uh, dominates the entire world or even a continent for that matter. Uh, it, w it would be much better if um, the world was a uh, multipolar. Uh, that's that's my take on things. Um, oh, that's and a very good point. Yeah, I mean that that's very, or or at least it we could, you know, shift focus much more to regionalism. You know, f for for states to organize along those lines, so we don't, you know. But but I I do understand what Jeff is saying here that 
we obviously are noticing a shift in, in world politics where the Chinese, they obviously do contain 90% of the supply chain in the world economy. So that gives the Chinese a tremendous amount of power. But we also need to understand... And whose fault is that? That's the, that is the fault uh, yeah. of capitalism. In order uh, to win only, the whole... Yeah. In order to win uh, the Cold War, they, they, they got in bed with China. They wanted to break exactly. China away from mm. the Soviets, and they undermined our own economies by doing so. Um, but, yeah, uh, wasn't, that, wasn't that stupid? It, was it, it really stupid, was. Wasn't it? Yeah. I, just want to, I just want to reply to Jeff when, when, when Jeff said, like, where do we draw the line? Which, part, which threat is the most imminent at this very moment? Is it that, that the Chinese and the Russians are raising missiles against us? They want to conquer, for instance, the Russians want to conquer Europe, and the Chinese are keen on conquering, you know, the United States and, you know, territorially, you know, d destroy the country, rip it to pieces, and so on. Or is the Zionist component of any importance whatsoever. I just want to reply to you, Jeff. Now, obviously, I see the threats coming from 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 both spots. If I act diplomatically, now, just one, one important element we have to understand. Like, and I I say this all the time: Who are the ones who helped the Chinese attain this amount of power? And I would, if I would point, I would say definitely Wall Street, because they have they have given the Chinese capital, they have given the Chinese technology to expand, and somehow it's our fault in the West that we see a shift in the in in the world economy favoring the Chinese, and this will have repercussions for the Europeans and for the United States as well. Now. I think it's very important to also take into consideration, uh, like, who are the ones who are overrepresented within the field of post-Marxism slash critical theory that constantly preaches that the West must be destroyed? Um, and also, why is it, we have seen neocons, for instance, hijacking US foreign policy, conducting very stupid foreign policy outcomes in the Middle East. And I mean, obviously, we have a Zionist components within the neocon movement too. And then I would and also Crystal. like to say, if if, if we have William Crystal, we, we have his late father Irving Crystal, we have Leo Strauss, and so on and so on. So so this is also. And then I would like to say also, is it such a? I think we have to look at Israel at least as a case study. Is it? the greatest ally for Europe and for the United States. And I would say simply no, if you look at the, the history of how this state has virtually conducted espionage cases, you know. And given given about, secrets directly to China, they've been caught numerous times giving military technology and to the Chinese on several occasions. Um, I think they gave them the Predator drone, um, you know, it's, they they play against all sides. <laughs> exactly. So 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 that's what Lamar is saying. That okay, you have a problem. Obviously, we do have a a, a a a military competition between great powers, and this will affect Europe and the United States in one way or another. We see China rising. You know, obviously, we see that the U.S. is in decline. However, I would like to say that I do not take this you know, standardized Western conception that, okay, if, if the U.S. empire declines, all of a sudden it will, it, it will mean that international Zionism will decline along the way too. I don't see this materializing whatsoever. On the other hand, I see international Zionism, you know, remaining just as powerful as it has been in the past, albeit it is, you know, it, it, it receives help from the Russians and from the Chinese too. So... So, so that's what I wanted to say. So therefore, it's important to understand how certain elements are able to manipulate interest that will obviously lead to the decline of the United States in terms of power. So I believe this is just as important like the Russians and the Chinese are raising missiles against us. That would be my remark. Go ahead, gentlemen. Um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't see it as important. I, I see that the main, the main issues here 
or is the is the growing belief in uh, Marxism or Marxist themes, the uh, communist movement, which the communists themselves run, of which they are a minority, which they create coalitions out of other groups that they bring along, women and minorities. Uh, uh, they got Islam they're bringing along with them. They're, they're all focused against the capitalist system, against the American flag. You see the burning American flags and throwing them on statues of George Washington and pulling the statues down. I think um, we're, we're undergoing a revolution. And the, mm. the danger is that the, our system will be dragged down and destroyed. And if our system is dragged down and destroyed, I don't give most of the people in this country will be killed because the Chinese want this land to create a second China. And I refer to the secret speech of Chiao Chen and to the information that I had from a uh, uh, Russian defector, Colonel Stanislav Lunev. Um, this is very serious to me because it's about the existence of my country and the survival of the people of my country, which is the United States of America. And um, I don't want my country to be an imperialist country, but I do believe that the Pax Americana, whatever its crimes or sins, and there's no such thing, you know, power is evil and, and there's always these bad things that go on, but the, the world has grown, the people have prospered, the world population, just to show, has gone from 3 billion people when I was a kid in the, in the late 60s to 7.7 .7 billion people today. And this, this kind of prosperity that has raised the standard of living of people all over the world, um, it, it's, it's fairly benevolent. And you don't find that kind of an effect when other great empires have dominated the world. So, um, you know, I don't, I'm not going to badmouth my country or, or blame it. I think those other countries scare me. And what they want to do to my country really scares me. And it mm. ought to scare but, all Americans. But I think it's vital to say, is a state, let's say a great power acting in accordance with maximizing its interests in a best possible way. And I would say that several great powers have not been able to do so because their interests get, get manipulated by certain, it could be certain lobby groups, it could be certain financial managerial interests and so on and so forth. So that's why I think it's very important to take these parameters into consideration. Uh, Lamar, please, I want to get your take too before we wrap this up because the time is going to an end when you have so much fun. So I think, please go ahead, my friend. Uh, mm. Yes, I definitely um, agree that we don't want this. Um, a lot of what's happening now uh, in the United States is scary. You have people burning down uh, their own neighborhoods. That's not smart. Um, they're being manipulated by um and we talked about Dugan earlier and he is part of his playbook the the strategy of tension you know you support all sides and watch them fight it out and it undermines uh, the nation as a whole in addition to that you do have the Chinese uh, they have uh, intelligence agents as well but they can essentially get their living room here in the United States without firing a shot uh, I mean several people from throughout uh what used to be the third world um uh, can do so because we have these uh, politicians and uh, prompted by you know who who want mass migration. I'm more afraid of Indians, uh, taking over the United States as opposed to the Chinese. Um, the Chinese have taken over uh, Vancouver from what I heard. I heard they call it Hancouver. Um, I think that's more of a West Coast problem perhaps. But here um, in North Carolina, there are several huge uh, Indian diasporas and uh, a lot cultural norms and attitudes are anti-Western. Uh, and um, mm. I mean, I don't want them to, to take over, but behind it all are, are the elites. The elites, um, the same people who exported the jobs to China mm. uh, and gave them the, 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 the reins over 90, would you say 97% of the supply chain? I mean, they did that in the interest of capitalism, which is why I always tell people we need to re-examine capitalism because Apparently, capitalism undermines the nation state in the long run. Capitalism may be, may be good to a certain point, but at a certain point, capitalism undermines uh, nation states, ethno-linguistic groups, because you can have somebody who's su supposed to be from your group 
and um, they'll do things in their interest, and it'll definitely undermine your interest. So um, that's Most my take important. on it. I think we have these elites that are, um, and, and unlike Alex Jones, uh, my my version of the globalist, uh, hell, mostly from uh, Israel. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and it's also quite interesting that how is it the case that if you look at the party at Davos, if you look at Bilderberg Association, if you look at, for instance, uh, other lobby groups, other ones, every one of these top organizations are so keen on that this tiny state is allowed to expand its frontiers without being subjected to any form of uh, international penalty, you know, and it, in comparison. So, so that's why I think that there is obviously a Zionist component to it. Now, it's very difficult to attribute how much they actually do control, but I would urge every one of the listeners tuning in here, just check out, for instance, the, the, the Rothschilds, the Barburi, the Lazards, and also how they have been interacting in the past, for instance, the Rothschilds with manipulating the interests of the British Empire. I think it's very important to take these yeah. into consideration, these manipulation, how you can manipulate certain great power interests to act in a certain way. And that's what I ask. Are these great powers acting logically in the sense that they're maximizing their own self-interest or are these interests being manipulated? And this is also very important because it could have, you know, severe repercussions for the economy and so on and for the populations. And also I want to say naturally you have these globalist internationalization both from socialism and also from the liberal capitalist vantage point that wants to destroy or somehow dismantle the power of the nation state. Obviously, we see Wall Street, they're, they're, they want to end the nation state, obviously, so capitalism can encapsulate the entire world. And Jeff, we are reaching an end. I want you to give me your thoughts a little bit before we wrap this up. Go ahead. Well, I think that uh, it's a it's a distorted, one-sided view that exaggerates the actual power and effect of one ethnic group. I don't think that's a good thing. I think it uh, it causes a um, a shift in focus, a paranoia away from a realistic view of what's actually going on and a more balanced view of what's really going on. And um, that's all I would say. Um, Lamar, my friend, would you reply? I mean, to Jeff um, on this. Uh, yes, I, I partially agree. Um, it's not just one group. Uh, again, there are other actors. There are other uh, interests involved. Uh, sure. But um, and, and there and there are other threats. A big part of my channel, and a lot of people disagree with me when I when I talk about this. But um, I blame a lot of it on uh, Saudi Arabia as well. Uh, the the, the yeah. tensions in the in the Middle East and throughout the world. I mean, most of the terrorism has been sponsored by Saudi Arabia or its um, ideology. So yeah, you can't blame everything on uh, the Hebrews, but um, you know, there when it comes to the elites and the in the actual uh, cabal that that export our jobs, that import people from parts of the world that they know are going to cause animosity and strife. Uh, you have to point the finger at. Um, that particular group, but then again, you do have other threats and uh, other groups that would uh, undermine our societies. And um, again, my, yeah. one of the things that I'm going to talk about in the future on my channel uh, is a lot of people ignore India. India is an elephant in the room, and uh, I would rather have the the Chinese uh, in control of Kashmir than the Indians, because um, the <laughs> the Indians uh, they'll they they kill and lynch people. When there's a rumor that they've eaten beef, you know they'll they'll rape girls and and you know commit all sorts of atrocities that even China wouldn't do. At least the Chinese are putting the Uyghurs into uh, re-education camps. The, the Indians would just kill the Uyghurs uh, in, in in brutal and horrific ways. So um, I think it's a good topic to 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 take on next time. I think it's I think many of the the, the audience would find this very interesting. Um, yeah, but very well summarized. I also want to 
to to to summarize a little bit. I I think it's it's very easy to stumble to 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 go into reductionism. Like for instance, if 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 you say, oh, you know, one group they're dominating the entire scope of international affairs or international economy. I never said anything like that. But it's also easy to say, you know, we have a socialist cabal. They dominating the media, the academia, the entertainment industry, the the you know the international enterprises and so on. So this this is also one form of reductionism too. That it it it, it can be a danger to do so. But I want to say, I think we kept it at a very good level. And like Lamar said, it's not only one group dominating it. But I think you should also analyze certain components. And like you mentioned, Saudi Arabia. Qatar, Bahrain, and so on, they're also influencing forces. And you have, for instance, Turkey too in the Middle East. So you have regional powers and corporations that I think we need a holistic view to get a better take. But gentlemen, I'm very fine now. I'm looking forward to do another show with you. And like I say, if you enjoy this, please make sure to hit that like button, make sure to subscribe. Leave me a comment. Let me know what you think of the discussion that we had. Let the comments flow. Okay, gentlemen, uh, thank you so much. And I um, hope to hear from you again, okay? Thank you for having me. And, and thank you, Jeff, for putting up with me. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lamar. No, it was great. It was, it was fun to have a discussion. Oh, it was I, excellent. I agree. Great. Well, listen, I will, I will put uh, your YouTube channel in the link description, and um, let's speak again soon, okay, gentlemen? Bye. All right.